Hello everyone, happy Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us for our final service of Awakenings 2022. Yes. We trust you had great church this morning at your home church and we're excited for what God is going to do today. We had such an incredibly powerful, beautiful move of the Lord last night. Absolutely. Brother Blackshear brought the word for the conference. He spoke a message called Defined by the Desert. And I know, just like me, you out there, when you hear that word desert, you associate that word with difficult times in your life, lonely seasons that you've been through. And he talked about how those seasons define us and, and make us who God wants us to be. It was a powerful word. And if you didn't get a chance to hear it, we encourage you to go back and listen to it online. Yes, and we know that we're going to have a great service today, too. But first, we have some very special guests with us. They have been helping us usher in the presence of the Lord yes. this weekend. First up, he is a world-renowned recording artist, and he calls Calvary Columbus home. Brother Mark Crowder is here with us. us. Brother Crowder. Thank you for being here. What is here. up? Glad to be with you guys. Yeah. Thank you. And we also have Sister Abigail Hayworth with us. Thank yes. you so much for joining us. Thank you. So you've been all over the country, Brother Mark. Where have you been and what has God been doing? Well, it's been an incredible time. Uh, the Lord's really opened up a lot of doors. I'm, we've been a lot of places, uh, yeah. California, Georgia, Texas. We were just together in Texas for TYC. It was a great event. Um, all over the place, Michigan. Name a state we've probably been there in the last 12 <laughs> months. So That's God's awesome. been really cool. Well, Brother Crowder, we want to give our online audience a little exclusive. So why don't you tell them what's next? What can they look forward <laughs> to? What's coming up in the timeline of Brother Crowder? Oh, praise God. Uh, well, Ohio Ladies Conference is next week. <laughs> I'm really excited about that event. Honestly, like, Ohio Ladies Conference is peak apostolic. I love that Ohio Ladies Conference. Um, I'm in Indiana the week after that. Um, back in Ohio for another conference the week after that, and then uh, in uh, Nevada, uh, uh, the state of Nevada after that. So it, it just keeps going, um, Florida after that. So it's uh, every week. That's <laughs> awesome. That oh. is awesome. Well, I know our viewers out there love you, and oh, they want to know how can we support you in your ministry right now? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for everyone that has uh, supported us. That's what makes apostolic music work. Every ticket that you buy to an event, whether it's for myself or James Wilson, Draylon Young has a recording. I'll be there in Indiana, um, be in Indiana two out of the next four weeks uh, for two different events, but I'll be at Draylon Young's recording. Please buy your ticket to support him. Um, it's gonna be an incredible, incredible event. You wanna be there. Um, that is September 30th. So go to his website and get those tickets. Uh, but every time you buy an event ticket like that, every time you uh, stream our music on YouTube is great. You know, all those things, it, it's a blessing to us. So continue to do that. Uh, share it with other people. And uh, right now, um, Anything Can Happen is the top 25 gospel song in the nation. Come on. So if you'll call your radio station and ask them to play, your gospel radio station, ask them to play Anything Can Happen by Mark Crowder, uh, so that would be a blessing as well. So That's good. Awesome. That is awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, Mark. Yeah, Sister Abigail, thank you so much for joining yeah, us. It's a pleasure to be so here. delighted to have you all the way from Ocala, Florida. Oh, yeah, the big city. Big That's city. right. The big the <laughs> horse capital of the world, That's I'm the truth. told. I will die on that hill. Yes. <laughs> so Sister Abigail, tell us what have you been doing since you graduated from IBC? I've been doing a lot and I love it. I've been back home, so I'm originally from Ocala came back home to serve under my pastor, Aaron Sizemore. I've been loving it. I've got to help serve with our music team, our youth team, um, done a lot of different kinds of things. And I've, like Brother Crowder said, been traveling around, which has been um, one of my favorite parts. I love getting to be at places like Awakenings. This is a great church, a great conference, definitely one of my favorites. Awesome. That is awesome. You obviously have such an impactful ministry. You're so talented. What is your piece of advice to others who are watching? What is your advice how to be a worship leader, how to have an impactful ministry? Um, well, I think that every ministry should start at wherever you're serving, wherever that is, your home church, your 
wherever you may be and get in alignment with your pastor's vision, um, whatever that may be for your church, your congregation. That's been the best advice that's ever been given to me. Find out what your pastor's vision is, grab a hold of it and communicate that with your team, whatever, you know, if it's a music team or a youth team or, or whatever. And um, always find yourself at the church. You know, if somebody asks where you are, even if it's a day off or, you know, a youth event or, you know, uh, just an event for ladies or whatever, yeah. find yourself at the church involved, getting your hands uh, serving in whatever you can do. I think that's really, really important that a worship leader be at church at all times. That is so good. Thank you so much for Thank that. Thank you. I love Thank being, you being here. Being here. Yeah, oh, it's so fun. We love, love having it. you here. Thank love you here. so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Wow, thank you to all of our guests who have joined us. We appreciate them and their ministry so much. We are looking forward to what God is going to be doing here today. Amen. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we encourage you to stay tuned in. Brother Mark Morgan is going to be bringing a powerful word to this conference in just a few moments. We know it's going to be incredible. We know it's going to be life-changing, so stay tuned in for that. Yes, praise God. Thank you so much for being here. And make sure you stick around for our wrap-up session. It's our last one this conference. Yes. So please stick around for that. You don't want to miss it. All right. We'll see you soon. Thank you. I don't know what tomorrow's gonna hold. I can say and say and say, victories tomorrow, victories tomorrow, victories tomorrow, victories tomorrow, but victory might not be tomorrow. I just gotta keep on going.
Why don't you stand to your feet, lift up your hands, and shout the name of Jesus all over this house. Somebody lift up your praise unto him. Lift up your worship unto him in this place. Hallelujah. Come on, you can be louder than that. Somebody lift your voice. Lift a shout unto God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. We've come to see God do something incredible in this place.
And if you feel comfortable, just go ahead and bring a couple of people into this altar. Some of these young people, bring somebody down here. We might as well just shout our head down in this place. Somebody say, hey, you should have been though I prayed through. Church was on fire, the Holy Ghost too. From the top of my head, soul of my feet, I felt the spirit moving on. You should have been there.
throw your hands up and just shout it a little louder. We love to call your name It's something we cannot explain
can call upon the name of the Lord. Can I hear what that name is? No, no, can I hear what that name is? Can somebody say it a little louder? Can I hear what that name is? There's no name like that name. Can you give him a shout of praise in the house? Sunday evening. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sweet Holy Ghost. Sweet Holy Ghost. Look at your neighbor. Tell him it feels good in the house. Now I know everybody's wondering because you know why I'm up here. You've been here every service saying, my Lord, it's going down every service. We're making headway. We're about 20 grand away. Somebody shout amen. That's good. And you know what? And the Lord can help us out, can he not? If you're new and this is your first service, I'll, you say, man, what's he talking about? We started the conference and we just felt like to just let everybody know what all this would cost. To put this on, to rent different equipment speakers and airfare and food and you know just everything 50 about fifty one thousand dollars so look what the lord has done so far we're down to about 20 grand can i give the lord huh i trust the lord and i'll, I'll just be honest i could stand right here and because this is such a giving congregation not just a giving church but every year people who come to awake it's just a giving congregation giving people so I could stand here and say all right who wants to give me 10 and who wants to give me 5,000 who wants to give me a thousand who can give me a hundred who can give me 500 who can give me 50 how many promises not to take nothing out of the plate I could go through and do all of that but I, we don't we're just not going to do that all right we're going to trust in the Lord here today, all right? When we leave this premises, I would like for everything that I have received, not you pay to receive something, but I would like for all the expenses to be handled on this local congregation that has waited on us, served us, been very kind to us, been letting us suck the air condition for free and registration was simple on everyone didn't cost nothing so you know what we're going to do it that way there's going to be of course text to give that'll be coming up and you can start taking down that number and that's the way that you like to do it and then after text to give we got a QR code and our ushers can start making their way down we got a QR code and that'll come up and you can check that out you just take your camera and hold it up there and then it tells you what all to do thank the Lord for technology and then of course there's Calvary Columbus.com uh, you might be watching online you might want to text to give or you might want to just give Calvary Columbus.com we still take checks we still take cash uh, anything spendable there you go, change, just whatever. And I'm not going to do some long, drawn-out thing. I could tell you story after story about men of God sitting right here in this building right now that gave to this conference that extraordinary things has happened for them back at their congregation. I, I, I literally could, I literally. Men that I've seen here in the last three nights literally they could tell you I did this and the Lord did this and I you don't do it to receive but he just does it because when we do it free will that's what the that's what the Lord does so we're going to ask the Lord here today Lord what is it that you would have me to give I, I, I really want you to be serious when uh, you ask the Lord that $20,000, I'm just going to be real honest, is not a little bit of money. $20,000 is a lot of money. So 
but I got a real big God that has blessed his people beyond measure. I'm telling you, the apostolic church has been blessed beyond measure, even through all kind of situations in the last few years. The Lord has blessed the apostolic church, and he's blessed the people of God. All right? So let's ask him today. Say, Lord, what is it that you would have me to give? Everybody say amen. Before we receive the offering, if you're a sponsor, be sure if you're wondering if you did what you're supposed to do, talk to Pastor Jimmy. He'll be kind and let you know. If you would like to be a sponsor of this conference, see Pastor, and he can tell you what it would cost to do that. And uh, we depend on some of our, uh, we depend really on all of our sponsorships just to help with some of the cost and then we determine what we need even including that we don't take that and put that off to the side that's the whole total deal so if you'd like to do that see Pastor Jimmy and he would love uh, for you to be a part of that again there's text to give there is the QR code there is calvarycolumbus.com cash and checks and the ushers are going to wait on the congregation because the Lord said he loves a cheerful giver all right how many promises to do something today huh you say i'm going to do something today all right all right in the name of the lord god bless you promises we're standing on his promises and here we have a comfort day
and say that. Whatever situation you came in with, just proclaim it over your situation. Every mountain has to move. Every crooked place has to be made straight. When you call the name of Jesus, when you speak the name of Jesus in that situation, for your attendance this year and I would remind you that again next year Labor Day weekend September 1st 2nd and 3rd we will be together here for awakenings and I know that many of you are who are here and have been here in years past would not want to miss next year but those of you who this is your first experience at awakenings we trust that what you have felt what you've experienced that you would not leave it here but you would take it home to the church where you worship and transform the atmosphere through what you've gleaned here I mentioned to you Friday night passing of Bishop William Cisco. I would tell you that the visiting hours are Tuesday, this Tuesday, 2.30 to 6.30. The funeral will be at 7 p.m. and all of this will take place at the church triumphant 101, excuse me, 1001 Vera Place, Columbus, Ohio. Awakenings does not take place without a lot of people doing a lot of hard work. And I just want to say thank you to every member of the Calvary Apostolic Church who has worked so hard over the past number of months to make Awakenings what it is for this weekend. We have mentioned our sponsors on a number of occasions, but to all of our sponsors who are here today and those who have had to leave due to their services today, we honor every one of our sponsors, who most of which have been with us for a number of years, and so they've been longtime supporters. So to every sponsor and their families and their church families who are here today, we say thank you. Without the vision, without a vision, without vision, the people perish. Thank you, Bishop, for your vision for Awakenings for the last several years. And Sister Stark, First Lady, thank you for all that you have done to make Awakenings what it is. Would you do what is appropriate? I can't think of an Awakenings that we've come together 
that God has not met us. Would you just clap your hands and would you thank the Lord for everything that he has done over every year that we have joined together. And then also for this year, what he has done and what he is going to do. Would you just clap your hands and would you, uh, with the fruit of your lips, magnify and thank the Lord with a heart of thanksgiving, uh, with praise on your lips.
That, that you remember them because of the memories you made on those days. And uh, San Francisco Giants defeated the Kansas City Royals 10-29-14. The reason I remember that is because I was in San Francisco when it happened. And we had been at church, I believe, I had gone to spend a few days with Brother Morgan, and we went for tacos after church. And I was still eating, and we were watching on the screen. It was a monitor, if you will. At the little taco shop, and I still remember I had quite a bit of food to eat, and it was the bottom of the ninth, or no, it was the top of the ninth, I believe. It was the bottom of the ninth. I think it was about, I don't know, there was an out or two. And you looked at me and said, finish that taco. And I said, okay. You said, because when they win, I want to go stand on the street and watch all these crazy people go nuts. One gulp. And I was out the door behind Brother Morgan, and we just stood there and watched people go crazy. And when you watch someone preach under the anointing, sometimes they appear as if they're not relatable. But one of the things that has been so impacting for all the messages you've preached, I know that you're relatable in the pulpit and out of the pulpit. You're consistent. You like fellowship and friendship. 
And we have had some enjoyable times that had nothing to do with the church service. And I appreciate a man with such powerful anointing that can still be relatable and it doesn't seem as though he lives off in a fantasy land that we can never get to. But Brother Morgan, I thank you for being who you are and being a relatable preacher of the gospel with great revelation. This church and this conference honors you and we would not be who we are and what we are without the ministry that God has given you to bless others with. Thank you. Would you come preach the word? Let's clap to the Lord today. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know, I've, I've met some folks that just take themselves way too serious. And uh, I was in a, I, I, don't, I don't know, some people try to act spiritual. You know what I'm talking about? They act spiritual. <laughs> I was in a meeting one time, and a guy was there, and we were in uh, Asia. This guy, the whole meeting we were in, he sat down at the end of the table and just, I, I thought he was in pain. And uh, I become very concerned about him because I thought he was in pain. And uh, that's facetious right there. Amen. And... Uh, he was down at the end, and he was all, the whole time, I mean, just like that. So finally, I raised my hand. I said, can I say something? He said, yeah. I said, are, are you okay down there? Are you in pain or whatever? No, I'm not in pain. I said, well, you look like you're in pain. I'm trying to look spiritual. Boy, I lost a bunch of you right there. Amen. Bible talks about laughter is a good medicine. Sometimes you just gotta laugh. Well, it's it's already locked up in here today. Amen. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta laugh. And uh, I I uh, served the district for about six and a half years, Bishop. And uh, we'd get one of those tense moments. And uh, unless you've been in a boardroom, then you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. And when they would do that, these guys would be in exchange. Brother Hughes, I'd look over. Brother Cop was the secretary. And I'd tell him some stupid joke. <laughs> I mean, they're out there having World War III. And I'm up there laughing. Me and Brother Cop was laughing. And uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I understand you can probably go too far with that, but you know, if you really believe that God's got it, and if you really believe that all things work together, then put a smile on your face. I, I told church, boy, I'm starting out really good here today. I told church one time, I said, I'm going to buy me one of those GoPros. I said, I'm going to have him fix a hat where I can wear it, right here. And I said, then when I'm preaching, it's going to scan out across here, and you're going to be able to see on the screen what I look at. <laughs> Anyhow, amen. God bless you for being here this afternoon. And uh, I know some of you are tired. It's, you know, you've been working a lot, and worshiping a lot and responding to preaching, but thank you for being here this afternoon. And I do want to take just a moment and say how much I appreciate Bishop Stark and his family and Pastor Stark. Stark and Stark. Amen. <laughs> I started to say it'd be like a prestigious law firm, but another word come to my mind be like a prestigious accounting firm. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So God bless you. Of course, good to be here with all of our friends. And uh, th thank you for letting us come back. And I had to come this year to redeem myself because I canceled last year. And uh, so <clears throat> I was glad the plane took off and landed right on time. And so God, God's good. Amen. And uh, of course, Dr. Hughes, appreciate you, love you, respect you highly. I want you to know. That. <laughs> 
I'm going to try to leave here today not bitter at Dr. Hughes because I showed him a word and I thought it meant this and he explained it meant something else so he just destroyed an entire sermon so I still may go ahead and preach it because you wouldn't know it anyhow <laughs> Amen. <laughs> all right let's go to Mark chapter 10 I uh, are the Thompson's here you are. I told them yesterday, I said, you guys may, I preach for them Thursday night and certainly enjoy myself being with them. And uh, so I told them, I said, now, you, you, may hear, you may have to hear it over again. And, uh, and I really had thought that. I wanted to really talk today about the, the church and the kingdom, kind of some things that are transitioning and happening. And so I was headed in that direction. And then this morning, uh, when I sit down, reading, praying, meditating a little bit, the Lord kind of, no, nah, not now. Here's what I want you to do. So we're going to obey him. It'll go better if I obey him. Amen. Mark chapter 10, verse number uh, 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and Ask him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now notice the terminology. What must I do? Brother Sism, it's good to see you. God bless you, sir. I love you. Amen. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one. That is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. Watch what he says. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I done from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. One thing thou lackest. Take your possession, sell it, and distributed among the needy. And the boy was very sorrowful for him. He was a rich, was rich, and he went away sorrowful. Amen. I want to talk to you today about one thing thou lackest. One thing thou lackest. Father, thank you again for an opportunity to stand before your people, to minister your word to the apple of your eye. I thank you for the congregation today. I thank you for the saints of God. Thank you, Lord, for what you've already done in this meeting. And I pray that you will continue this afternoon. Confirm your word with signs following. In the name of Jesus, we need your help, Lord. Give us clarity of mind. Let us preach with your wisdom and love. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. Shake somebody's hand while you're being seated and say, I hope you don't lack anything. You know, most leaders would gladly accept the rich young ruler as is because of the potential of him being a blessing. Amen. But boy, Jesus knew how to kind of hit you hard. I heard a message years ago, old elder priest, his message was, you really don't want Jesus as your pastor. Because I guarantee you the first time he called you a dog, You'd find another church. <laughs> and uh, he's telling this parable, and, uh, or he's telling the story. And the, the, some of the key statements in this story intrigue me because uh, this 
rich young rulers only interested in how do I inherit? How do I get eternal life? Tell me. Tell me what I need to do. And uh, I noticed a long time ago that they are called the Beatitudes, not the do attitudes. You can do but not be. Well, that was about as profound as it's going to get here today, right there. <laughs> we have a lot of people that do certain things, but is that who you are? And so he, uh, he's asking the Lord, what, what, what do I need to do to inherit this eternal life? Of course, Jesus said, well, first of all, why are you calling me good? There's none good but God. But uh, you know the commandments. That's another key statement. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, All these have I observed from my youth. In other words, I do these things. I, I observe this. I'm, I'm faithful to these things. And then... <clears throat> Jesus said, yeah, that's true, but one thing thou lackest. Now, you would think that if he did all these other things, that that one thing would not be so significant. And so I think it does us well to observe that one thing because Jesus could have said, you're right, you do all these other things, I'm proud of you. Come on over here and join the club. We'll give you a special parking spot. Be here for every offering. But Jesus didn't do that. So my question is, what is so significant about that one thing? Now, when Jesus responds back to him, he says, this thing you lack. He said, I want you to take your possessions I want you to sell it, liquefy it, and I want you to distribute it among the poor. And the boy, the Bible says the boy was very rich. He went away sorrowful. And uh, <clears throat> Jesus was grieved about it. He loved him. The fact is, is, you know, do you really think that God is after the boy's money? Do you really think that God is after just trying to uh, you know, you got too much money and uh, I'm going to teach you that it's harder for a rich man to enter a camel. So he, he wasn't after his money. I am convinced, firmly convinced that he was not after the boy's money. And I got, I want to tell somebody something here today. God is not after your money. If God wanted to get your money, he could move on an IRS agent somewhere. <laughs> if all that God was after is your money, and I've heard people say that, it's just all about money with the church. All you want me for is my money. God is not, God is not after your money. There's something much bigger at stake here that God is after. You know, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says something like this. I don't care if you give all of your possessions to feed the poor, but if you don't have charity, it didn't profit you one thing. So it wasn't that God was telling the boy that you lack just uh, benevolence or just, you know, I'm after your money. But what he's really telling the boy is, you lack love. And one of the indicators that he lacks love is this terminology. What must I do? What must I do? Give me the list of what I have to do to sing in the choir, to be a member of this church, mm. to be a part of the fellowship, Give me the list of things that I need to do. And I'm telling you, I'm just going to shoot straight with you. 
We're eat up with that. Just give me the things and I'll do them. God's not interested in you just doing these things. There's something much beyond just doing these things. So the deal is, is uh, you can get all the list and you can do all of that, but if there's not love involved in it, it's really going to profit you nothing. Oh, it's quiet, 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 quiet. It's not going to profit you anything. So I think that what Jesus was telling the boy is, is yeah, you've kept all the commandments. You, you've kept them all. But I'm about to introduce some commandments. And uh, I'm trying to see if you will honor and keep this commandment. Because when you get to the epistles, it derives down to this. There's only two commandments. Believe on the name of his son and love the brethren. Those are the two commandments that God has given us. Now, if you keep those, I'm convinced that if you keep those things, then you don't need the other commandments. If you love your brother like you ought to love him, you're not going to steal from him. You're not going to covet anything from him. You're not going to commit adultery with his wife. None of that stuff's going to happen. And so this is what God knew. And he also knew as the Pharisees and the Jewish people proved to him, you can have all these other commandments and you can do all these other things, but you're missing something that's very vital and you're missing something that's very important. You do all these things. I mean, brother, you'll move heaven and earth to proselyte one person. And you say, we even tithe on our spices. But the fact is, you're missing something. This was the dilemma that the apostle Paul found himself in, was the Judaizers that followed him everywhere that he went, trying to, trying to tell people, let's go back to the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to observe this. You need to observe that. The problem was, is they had a list of what you need to do, but they were not there by faith and they were not there operating out of the love of God. Ooh, maybe we ought to dismiss right now. So I don't wanna, I wanna kinda dive off in this just a little bit. Will, will, will you let me do that? I, I, I got, got to reading this morning a little bit and I went to Galatians. Uh, and uh, chapter 5, verse 6, For in Christ, Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith which worketh by love. So, I, 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 okay, God, I, what does that really mean? I, I need you to help me to understand what that means. And so this is the best definition of it that I got is, Faith through love becomes operative and influential because it is possible for you to have faith and not have love. Oh boy. <laughs> Fasten your seatbelt. I'm just going to preach to me today and make you listen. Is that fair enough? And, uh, so, you know, even, even going back to 1 Corinthians 13, now I'm just going to tell you right now, I do not like 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If it was left up to me, I'd rip it right out of the Bible. But it's not left up to me. Because when you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it makes you look at yourself. Because the Apostle Paul says, you know what? I don't care if you have faith to move a mountain. I don't care if you understand all mysteries. Mm. Now, this is what we emphasize. Now, just let me finish the sermon before you get upset. This is what we emphasize when you need to have faith and you need to understand mysteries and you need revelation. You can get all of that, but that does not make it operative. It doesn't activate it. Mm. You could have all of that, but you didn't have, he said, I don't even care if you give your body to be burned at the stake. If you don't have charity, you don't have love, it's profiting you nothing. Ooh. 
I don't care if you Corinthians can do all this stuff. To him, it's just a, a noise, just a bunch of rattle to him. I'm telling you, I, I don't like that First Corinthians 13 because, you know, I get to feeling pretty good about myself and then I start going down through there and I see all this list of stuff. Love does not, love is not puffed up. Love vaunteth not itself. It thinks no evil. Boy, I'm, I'm, I'm strike three right there, amen. I mean, here you go. You get into all this and you start looking at it and then, then you read the statement, faith, hope, and charity. Woo, three folk cords not easily broken, faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is The greatest of these. Now, now, I'm really going to mess with you. I'm going to mess with you. The highest dimension that you can operate in is in the true character of God, nature of God, which is God is love. I was asking the Lord this morning. I said, explain to me, help me understand. Um, uh, the fact that in the end time, the Antichrist is going to call fire down from heaven. The Antichrist is going to perform great miracles. So there's going to be a little running parallel tracks with God's people and the Antichrist. It's kind of like Moses and them. And so, okay, God, they can duplicate these things. So what is it that separates us. I mean, they can, they can duplicate fire, they can duplicate miracles, they can duplicate power, but what is it about all this? And he said, there's one thing they cannot duplicate. Because it doesn't say God is power, he has power. It doesn't say that God is fire, except he is a consuming fire. But the fact is, is all those things you know, the enemy can take it and twist it and pervert it. And then, you know, now we're faced with this stuff and all. Listen, I've been to places to where I've been, yeah, anyhow, I, I, I've been in living rooms where you won't start talking about supernatural. The church has to have the supernatural. I've been in living rooms with them when they threw some kind of satanic something, moving stuff on the wall and causing things to levitate and all the stuff and all. And so, you know, to the common person, well, you know, you people talk about signs and wonders and you people talk about, you know, the supernatural, but they have the supernatural. Ooh. But remember one thing Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. I feel like preaching here a second. That you are my disciples. They may duplicate miracles, signs, and wonders, but there's one thing they cannot duplicate, and that is the love of God because it's exactly that. It is God is love. It's not just the love of God, but God is love. Will you stay with me just a little longer? God is love. Now, I got over here in Galatians, got to look at that this morning, and and, and got to reading down through some commentaries. And it takes me, when it says, in Christ Jesus, it took me back over to John chapter 15. And so Jesus is given this illustration. Uh, the closing of John 13 all the way through John 17 is one long conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. He's leaving the Last Supper, he's headed to the garden, and he's going through there and he's talking to them. Historians tell us that when he starts giving them the illustration of the vine and the branches, that he was literally standing in a vineyard when he gave it. So he's using a backdrop. And then he gets to talking about, I'm the vine and you're the branches. And if you abide in me and I abide in you, then you're going to produce fruit. And if you are producing fruit, now this is the one that I don't like. If you are producing fruit, then I'm going to purge you. And I'm going to prune around you. And I'm going to cut on you so you can produce more fruit. Okay, God, I'm finally producing some fruit. Can you leave me alone? No, I'm going to work on you where you produce more fruit. Now, I've heard people use that passage of Scripture because later it goes on that Jesus said, you know, if, 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 if you're not bearing forth fruit, you're going to wither and die. Men are going to gather you and cast you into the fire. 
I think I've said this here before, but I repeat it. It doesn't say that angels are going to cast you into the fire. It says that men are going to cast you into the fire. I've also heard people say that fruit in that particular passage is about souls and winning souls. Now, don't, do not misunderstand me. He's not talking about soul winning. What he's talking about will result in soul winning. But what he's actually talking about is love. If you abide in me and I abide in you, he said, it's not your love, it's my love. I am the source of it. It flows from me to you and through you. And if you get disconnected from me, whoo, if you get disconnected from me, you're gonna wither and die. You'll not produce my love. Now the apostolics need to wake up and get this revelation. You better stay connected to me because you cannot produce this on your own. And if we get severed from each other, you're gonna wither and die, you'll produce no fruit, and men are gonna gather you and cast you into the fire. You know what that literally means? You're gonna be put in situations with people that's going to consume you and burn you up. And brother, when you get disconnected, trust me, there's something headed your way. There's fire coming your way. There's a situation coming your way. And I'll go a step further. Even if you are bearing fruit, he's getting ready to do a little pruning in your life so you can bear a little more fruit. Well, God, I, I'm, I'm starting to bear some fruit. Yeah, you are. But there's some things that we need to cut away. Boy, this is not going over right now. This, this, we're gonna, we're gonna do a little pruning. Boy, isn't it amazing that one of the tests that God has for us is with other human beings? Just about the time I think I got this relationship right and the love of God is operating in my life, God says, Psst, hey, you, come here. I need to produce more fruit in him. And the only way I can do that is you helping me. Ooh, it's locking up in here. <laughs> See, I've always for years called it agents of crucifix. See, you can't crucify yourself. I went out in the garage one time just to prove this point. I did. I went out in the garage. David, I went and got a nail and a hammer. And, and, and so I took it and uh, I, I, this back when I could touch my toes and I put my feet down and tuck in that. I, I could do that, I could nail that to the cross. And then I could raise up and I could take this hand, hold a nail right here and I could nail that. Then how am I gonna finish this? So that's when it dawned on me that God has agents of crucifix that he's assigned in my life. Their job is to make sure I get finished off. Ooh. But Jesus understood that. I can't crucify myself. And those that were crucifying him, he didn't curse them. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Lord, they're just doing what you called them to do. You're, they're just doing the things that was prophesied that they would do. They just happen to be the agents of crucifixes in my life. And every one of you here today, trust me, God is going to send agents of crucifix in your life. It's not for you to despise them. It's not for you to hate them. You ought to thank God for them. Now I'm telling you, I'm preaching something that's hard to live. You need to thank God for them. I remember old brother Wayne McClain told a story one time. Hey, man, they were going through it. The church was going through it. And he said about 3, 30, 4 o'clock, he got up, went down to the church and was in there. And he said, I was praying and talking to God. And he said, the Lord spoke to me. He was such a great Christian, such a great man of God. So the Lord spoke to me and said, Wayne, if this wasn't going on in your life, in your church, where would you be at right now? He said, well, Lord, I'd uh, probably be in bed resting. And he said, that's why it's happening. That's why it's happening. 
He said, I realized then that what was going on was God was working something in me. Not, not for the people, but he's working something in me. I don't know about you, but I've had situations like that. Man, I'm telling you, I wanted, I, I wanted to be a son of thunder. I mean, I'm ready to call fire down on them. Bless God, nuke them. Bunch of Samaritans, nuke them. I mean, that's, that's James and John. Call fire down from heaven on them. And buddy, Jesus whirled around on them and said, you don't know what spirit you're of. Isn't it amazing that John goes from John the son of thunder, nuke them, to John the beloved. And every time you read about John now in the Gospels, he's very close to Jesus. In some passages, he's got his head over on his chest. I mean, he's close to him. And what he's doing is, is he's changing his nature to the nature that God wanted to manifest through him. And so when Jesus said, this is your old nature, you're a son of thunder. Brother, you're ready for judgment to fall on everybody. Ooh. I had a young man call me here a while back and a situation going on in the city and the church and on. He said, I'm just praying to God to kill him. And I've been there before. I, I really have. I had a guy in the Oak Mogey church. He caused me more grief. I mean, like we had a new convert that he was talking to one day. And this is what he says to the new convert. I wouldn't get too close to Brother Morgan. He said, I've been in this church for years. He said, I've been around Pentecost for years. He said, I can't name one man of God that I know that didn't have something wrong in their life and usually committed adultery. So you need to be very careful how close you get to the man of God. Mm. Well, he said it to the wrong person because this guy, he, he loved me. I'd paid his utility bill before they got in church. I'd helped them. And so... They were working on a car when that old man said that. And he, this old boy backed up and started rolling up his sleeves. And the old man said, what you doing? He said, I'm, I'm getting ready to whip you. <laughs> the old man said, what? He said, I'm getting ready to whip you. He said, I ain't going to sit there and listen to you talk about that man like that. That man has done me nothing but good and helped me and my family. And I'm in the church today because of that man and the love that flowed through him and manifested to us. And he said, I'm not going to sit here and let you talk to me like this. Now you've got two choices. You can stand here and keep it up and it's not gonna be good for you or you can leave right now. Don't ever come back over here again. He chose the latter, amen. <laughs> that old man, I mean, one time I was in, out of town preaching. They called me and told me something else he'd done. He'd sat in the back of the church and he'd, he'd, <laughs> he, 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 the, the sound was loud and it was. I mean, I'm not saying that it wasn't, it was. But instead of just coming up after church saying, you know, pastor, sounds a little, you know, he, he started coming in and had white cotton balls. I mean, it, it wasn't just stuck in his ear. It was out of his ear. And then he would sit back there and he'd, he'd do this. Now, I'm not a good pastor. And I've had to work on this love stuff. He'd get back there and do that and he'd mumble stuff make little sly remarks and stuff. So he's sitting back there doing that one time and he was sitting kind of over in this section. The sound booth was over on the right side and I had to look past him to the sound man. The sound man's name was Larry Killian. And so I looked back to Larry and I went. <laughs> now God was getting ready to purge me right here, prune on me a little bit right here. And so Larry's like, you serious? So he turned up and he went, I said. <laughs> well, that was being cast into the fire right there. Trust me, amen. And he, I mean, brother, it was like, he went, I said, no, I want it. Oh. <laughs> you better thank God for these two men that they love you and they... <laughs> <laughs> I know they'd never do anything like that. <laughs> Staff church, here you come. Cotton balls and all, here you come up there. <laughs> what you trying to do, bust my eardrums? I said, yep. 
Because you know how, have you ever seen the old Pioneer Speaker poster? It's got a guy sitting in a chair. He's in front of two big Pioneer Speakers and the wind's blowing him back. I mean, it's just, well, that's kind of how that service was starting to look that night. <laughs> I said, look, I don't have a problem with you wanting to turn down, but I got a problem with you sitting back there acting like you're acting and doing what you do. Now, you can walk up here like you just did and say, you know what, Brother Morgan, it's really loud. Could you help us out? And I said, I, I'll try to do my best. But I said, if you'd act like that, that's mild stuff that this guy would do. So I was preaching out of state one time, and I woke up late at night, and I was troubled. I was troubled in my spirit. So I got down beside the bed, and I said, God, you got to deliver me from this man. I'm, <laughs> seriously. I, I need some help here. This guy's causing a lot of grief in the church. See, what I didn't know is sometimes God sends a man into a city to build a church. Other times he sends a man into a city to build a man. Trust me, God's working on me right there. As clear as I'm talking to you, I heard the Lord say, I'll take care of it. He's a dead man. I got up kind of like, that was easy. <laughs> Think I'll do that more often. <laughs> Ooh. I, I, I know where I need to go. So I crawled back in bed, justified, because how wicked that man was. Stolen from people in the town. I mean, you wouldn't believe the stuff. So I'm laying in bed, and all of a sudden, I get pictures of his family and his precious wife. Hmm. What's this going to do to them? So I'm trying to go to sleep. Stop bugging me with this. Just get the job done, God. You're my hit man. And then it's like, Phew. so I crawl back out of bed, get down beside the bed. God, for the sake of his family, spare his life. God said, are you schizophrenic? What do you want me to do? <laughs> I felt peace come to me. So I drove home that Sunday afternoon, was back in Sunday night service. I told my brother Jeff what had happened the night before. He's like, oh, my God. And this man, we didn't have open testimony service. It's dangerous. <laughs> and so in the, he's, he's raising his hand. He wanted to testify. I'm like, oh, my God. So I said, brother, oh, I almost said his name. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> that was close. I, I, I can't say his name, but the puppet might be able to say his name. <laughs> and so I said, what? He said, I need to testify. I said, okay. He said, yeah, last night I was laying in bed about such, such the same time. And he said, there's a devil coming in my room. He said, like I felt my chest tightening up and I knew I'm dying having a heart attack. He said, I kept rebuking that thing. He said, finally lift it. I looked around Jeff, just like, oh my God. <laughs> well, I never did tell the guy. I don't think it was your rebuking. You can't rebuke it if you're not submitted to God, so I don't think you had anything to do with it. But boy, God taught me a lesson right there. And I told that young man, I said, you're so quick. I said, let's change this scenario. I said, instead of asking God to kill him, Ask God to bless them. Ask God to work on their nature, their thinking. He said, I have to pray that? I said, yeah. I said, because what this is really about is, it's not about those men now, it's about you. It's about a situation coming into your life that is showing something in your heart that anybody that opposes you, God's supposed to become your hit man. Well, which door do I need to try to run out of here? <laughs> and Brother Stark, I, so he changed it. He changed it. Changed the way he prayed. He called me. He said, I'm sorry. I was wrong. My spirit was wrong. 
I said, listen, did God tell you it would come to pass? He said, he did. I said, I was there and told you it would come to pass. He said, you did. I said, then why are you letting these men that are resisting this cause you to come to this point? God's going to take care of this. God's going to do this. Ooh, just walk on now. now I'm telling you, I'm, I'm good at giving advice. It's a little hard for me to live the advice that I'm giving. And so he, sure enough, he went to the deal and called me back and said, you're not going to believe this. We got to the meeting. He said, we sat down. And he said, man, he said, the change, the change in that council was so incredible. He said, it passed. They agreed to it. He said, people that had been resisting us had stood there that day and said, we're going to do it. I said, aren't you glad now that you didn't call fire? Ooh. And I'll tell you something else. Better be careful when you're online and you're calling fire down from heaven on everybody. Well, 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 well. I done messed this service, so I mean, I don't know if we'll ever recover. John, John. Now, are y'all ready? You're not letting me know if you're ready. You're like, uh, tell us first, and then we'll let you know if we're ready. <laughs> Here's the deal. Fruit, a, a, a vine cannot bear fruit of its own. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now, I've been asking God to help me understand some things, Bishop. And uh, why are our prayers not being answered? <laughs> Your word says, what sort of things you ask? Why are they not being answered? Does anybody else ever think about stuff like that? Oh, come on. I need more honest folks than that. Come on, put your hand. If you've ever thought. And then this morning I got to look at that and it tied me into something else. I said, look, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then whatsoever things you ask. But if you get disconnected from me, your praying and your asking is in vain. The only way that I'm going to give you the things that you ask is if you're connected to me. I'm talking to apostolics right now. Now, the deal is, if you don't think that this is important, let me help you with something. John writes to, in the book of Revelation, he addresses seven churches. Six of those churches over here, I mean, they had all kinds of stuff. Dr. Nicolaitans, Jeze Seed of Jezebel, Seed of Satan. I mean, they had all kinds of messed up church. But the Ephesians, the church of Ephesus, was the most apostolic church there was. That's it. I mean, brother, read, read, read down through there. He said, man, you hate evil. You try them to say they're apostles and are not. He said, you've held to my name. He said, I mean, man, you're the most apostolic church there is. But I got something against you. You would think he would just keep commending them for the things that they had done. I got something against you. He said, you better repent. And here's what you better repent over. You've left your first love. And because you've left your first love, he said, if you don't repent and get back to it, he said, I'm going to remove your candlestick. Now, six other churches with all sorts of crazy stuff going on in it, I'd never threatened them to remove their candlestick. It was only the church of Ephesus, the Jesus name folks. Those folks that hated evil, held to his name, he told them, if you don't get back to this, he said, I'm going to remove your candlestick. So it's John writing these things. It's John writing these things. John leaves the Isle of Patmos from getting that revelation, writing it. Now, I personally believe that he said and to the angel of the church of Ephesus that he was talking to Timothy. Timothy was still the bishop of the church of Ephesus when he wrote it. He's addressing Timothy. Now, if you'll remember, Timothy's over here. He's battling with fear. You read the first letter of Paul to Timothy. It's about church order. And it's about how you ought to behave yourself when you come to the house of God. So all the folks that said it's not important to come to the house of God, why did Paul spend so much time telling them the order of the house of God? 
And the second letter, the tone of it completely changes because it's apparent that Timothy has become fearful. Now, if you understood Ephesus, you could almost understand why he had become fearful. Man. And so this fear is working on him. Paul has to tell him, God did not give you a spirit of fear. But of love, power, and a sound mind. If you keep operating in this fear, you're going to get disconnected from love. And if you get disconnected from it, I'll remove your candlestick. Woo. That verse doesn't mean go back to where you was at as a new convert, but in some ways it might. But what it literally translates is, you have become disconnected from me. You are to love me first. And because you are disconnected from me, you are now disconnected from the brethren. You quit loving me, and now you quit loving the brethren. Oh, you're Jesus' name. You're apostolic. But you're lacking one thing. I'm glad you got all this other stuff, rich young ruler, but you're lacking one thing. And if you don't get that one thing, all this other stuff doesn't matter. Can I preach us apostolics here today? I don't care how doctrine pure you are. I don't care, bless God, I won't put up with anything. Brother, I'm so holy. I mean, my hair link, my dress link, my sleeve link, my tongue leaf. I'm so holy. You can be all of that and you can learn how to do all of that. But that's not what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to be. You can do all of that and be meaner than a junkyard dog. You can sit around and judge everybody that's close to you. You can condemn everybody that's not quite like you. You've literally become a Pharisee. Now don't walk out of here saying Brother Morgan doesn't believe in all that stuff. I believe it as strong as everybody else in this building today. But I'm telling you, I've been at this long enough to know. We can get all the trappings. We can say the same thing the rich young ruler said. All of these things have I kept from my youth. I've never committed adultery. I've never stolen. I've done all the things. But you got a problem. You want to know what you got to do to have eternal life. I'm trying to help you understand what you need to do to have eternal life. Quit trying to get a list. The list is no good if you don't get this one thing. And that's why the enemy is constantly after that in your life. Can I go a little further? Listen to this one. Listen, listen, let me, let me find over here. Let me find over here. From which come wars and fightings among you? Can they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not. Because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Now, if you go to the previous chapter, chapter 3, listen to what he says, James says to them. He said, but where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. Now, remember, you, you, you have not because you don't ask. But when you do ask, you ask amiss. You ask, but you don't receive it. Mm. Okay, God help us. Now here's John weighing in on it. You ready for it? See, John, that last living apostle, moves from the Isle of Patmos to Ephesus. And it's at Ephesus that he writes his epistles, and then he writes his gospel. When he gets to Ephesus, he spends more time, two subjects, he's dealing with the Gnostics and all the stuff that there's no flesh, everything's Logos. And then he's dealing with the fact that in Ephesus, he's trying to help them. See, it's John who could say, I was with him in the vineyard. I was standing there when I heard him say, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Stay connected to me. And so John is writing to us, letting us know 
that if we get disconnected from him, we're in trouble. And the way he said it was is, you start hating the brethren. Boy, start hating the brethren. Can't get along with them. No love in your heart. No. So now you got a problem. If you hate your brother, he said, let me tell you what you are. He said, you're in darkness, you're not in the truth, and you're a liar. Now, I didn't say that, John said it. I don't care about all this other stuff. And this is the very area, don't you listen to me, I'm trying to help somebody here right now. This is the very area that the enemy targets. I gotta get them disconnected. I gotta let situations come into their life that gets them disconnected. I've gotta get grievances and in, in, in all in their hearts so I can get them disconnected. Because if I can get them disconnected from him, they'll disconnect from them. And when they disconnect with them, they have no power in their prayer. Ooh, still with me? They have no power in their prayer. Now, you know, we apostolics, we don't think that. We think as long as we can jibber jabber a little bit in tongues, everything's okay between me and God. Let me help you something about tongues. Tongues can fool you if you're not careful, and they can deceive you if you're not careful. Just because you can respond to something and jibber jabber a little bit, that's not God's sign of approval on your life. That's. I don't think that would be considered fruit. Now, the enemy works on this because John goes on to say, now, here's the deal. If you see your brother hath need and you shut up your bowels of compassion, how say ye the love of God abideth in you? For you are not to love in word, but in deed, action. You can't say, I agape you. It's a verb. You can only show it. You can only manifest it. You can only do it. So for us to walk around shaking hands saying, I love you, I agape you, that's impossible. You, 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 that, 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 you can't do it that way. But when you see your brother hath need, and you're moved with compassion to help that brother, then John said, yeah, the love of God is operating within you. It's, it's, it's the agape that's operating within you. You're connected to your source, and your source is allowing his love to flow through you to minister and to help that person. But if you shut up your bowels of compassion, he said, it's not there. And then he goes straight from that to these two things. And I've heard this kind of misquoted. He said, and if your heart condemn thee not, then hast thou confidence toward God. But if your heart condemns you, you have no confidence toward him. You know what John just said, realistically what he just said? If you have hatred in your heart toward a brother, you're already condemned. And you can ask and ask and ask, but it's not going to happen. But if you'll get under that condemnation and get away from it and get your heart right toward me and toward the brethren, he said, then that releases my power to flow through you. And then whatsoever things you ask. I'm gonna hurry to a close. See, we, uh, we can I just be honest? We, I have a little trouble with that. I have a little trouble with that. Just about the time I think I'm doing okay. Somebody, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Or somebody borrows $20 from me and forgets to pay it back. Or somebody lies on you or misrepresents you or hurts you deeply. We're supposed to be Christians. We're supposed to be brethren. This is the real world we're living in right now. This is the battle in society right now. This is why there's so much hatred and race wars because of what I'm talking about right now. I'll tell you what will fix it, what would fix it if the world could ever see the church operating the way that it's supposed to operate, and that's the true love of God. Now, I'm gonna end with something positive here in just a second. Why don't you listen? Don't you listen? James, I'm, I'm hurry. James is addressing some situations and I think that the subject of the book of James, the theme of the book of James is patience. 
because you've got two classes of people. You've got masters and you've got servants. And the masters were being treated with uh, great acceptance in the congregation. But the masters were mistreating the servants horribly. And so James and the church leaders are telling the servants, just be patient. Just be patient. Got to take care of it. God will deal with this. And of course, James goes into if there's someone that rich comes in with goodly ringing on, boy, you put him in a high seat. The rich young ruler. But he said, but these other things, you're not in justice. He then goes on to talk about the royal law. It's the royal law of the kingdom. This supersedes all other laws. Love the brethren. Love the brethren. Is this too simple here today? Love the brethren. That's the royal law of God's kingdom. And uh, then he makes that statement where there's envy and strife, there's confusion in every evil work. I, uh, Jason Huckabee called and, uh, the other day and he said, I need to talk to you. I said, all right. He said, God's dealing with me very strong about the word strife. He said, talk to me about it. And I said, well, you know, he said, I know a little bit, but I mean, I think God's got you on a quest and I'll, I'll join it with you. I said, I don't have all the answers to it, but I'll join it with you. Let's, let's go to the word together. Let's pray about this together. So we started and got over in the book of Proverbs and strife comes from pride. And started all this stuff and all. And uh, I was at Apostolic Conference and asked, uh, asked Brother Wright. I said, what do you think that word strife there means? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm about to get 400 pages of a definition of strife. Amen. <laughs> and he said, go look in the book of James where it talks about strife and it derives down to uh, political, electioneering, becoming political at any cost. You don't care what kind of destruction you do. As long as you can just get that position or yeah yeah never fails never fails church is moving toward harvest the promises of God and the things of the spirit and then somebody somebody wants a better position or they want their position confirmed they want their opinion to be the opinion. The next thing you know, there's strife that comes in. And a Midianite spirit comes. Six years, every time Israel got ready to harvest, the Midianites would come. Midianites, descendants of Midian, the name means contentious or brawler. Every time they were ready to harvest, a fighting spirit would manifest and come up there and totally take over. And it never fails. Let a district, let an organization, let a local church, let a ministry start moving toward harvest. Trust me, there's going to be somebody close by that's going to start finding something that they want to fight about. And they want to create strife. But you better be careful about creating strife. Let me, let me help you with something. You know, we all here today, I think, would agree that homosexuality is an abomination. Doesn't care what society says, the word declares that. I had a boy here a while back say, well, so does eating shellfish. It says it's an abomination. I said, it does, son. That's true. He said, you eat lobster? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. And he said, well, see, you're an abomination. I said, that's not what it says. He said, yeah, that's what it says. I said, no, that's not what it says. It says homosexuality is an abomination unto God. It says eating shellfish is an abomination unto you. And I said, puts it in a completely different position. But let me tell you something else that's an abomination to God. He that soweth discord yes. among the brethren. There's discord and there's harmony. And the church is moving forward. And then somebody wants to start sowing discord. It's usually over their will and what they want. See, we don't want to go to the altar and die out to our will and find the will of God. We want to establish our own will. This is our own thinking. This is coming out. Of, oh, here we go. This is coming out of that earthly wisdom that's sensual, that's soulish and demonic by nature. It's coming out of that. Because it's coming out of that, it leaves a wake of destruction. 
had somebody tell me, so we did this by the wisdom of God. I said, you're lying on the word of God. I said, all you've left is a wave of destruction. You've created more discord. You've created more confusion. You can't sit there and tell me that that's the wisdom of God. That's your wisdom. That's coming out of your own soul. And you better be careful coming out of your soul because the next step is it becomes demonic. I said, but the wisdom of God, here's the characteristics of it. It's peaceable. It makes peace. It's sown in peace. It's known for peace. If you're sitting there saying, operate by the wisdom of God and everything in your family, your home, your ministry is in a wave of destruction, you're lying on the Holy Ghost. You need to come to the altar today and say, God, I need to get rid of all this stuff. I'm self-willed. I need to get rid of all this. This is the way I think it ought to happen. And I need to stay down here until I get connected with you again. And your will and your mind can become my will and my mind. And I can operate by the will of God. Mm. Everybody wants to be right. Anna Vance preached for me years ago in Oak Mulgee. Never forget the message. Never. The essence of the message was what makes you right is if you admit you could be wrong. And what makes you wrong is when you say, I'm right. Hmm. This is it. This is what's got to happen. Careful with that. Did that come from you or did it come from God? Buddy, when it's about you, you start causing a lot of strife and confusion. I am convinced that if the enemy can create strife. I listened to Dr. Hughes yesterday. I think it was him. Somebody talked about the ascent going up to the house of God, Dr. Hughes. And I wrote it down, jotted some notes down about it never fails you're on your way to the house of God as families and next thing you know some of those something irritates you and you know you're ready to go and your wife's a little late and you're ready and get in the car and you've got right right and here you go and the next thing you know it's strife oh it, it escalates down here something trivial but if you just keep going at it next thing you know there's strife in your home and when there's strife in your home there's confusion and the scripture says if you and your spouse are not in agreement or harmony and live in that way, your prayer hits that roof and bounces right back down. You can't fuss and fight all week in your home and cuss each other on the way to church and then walk in here and expect God to honor your worship and your prayer and give you what you want. Now, let's, let's, just, let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. I've pastored a long time, and invariably, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen right before church. Somebody's going to call about something. Somebody's going to be upset about something, or you're going to get the email. And I am convinced this is the way that the enemy says, let me render your services powerless. Let me just get you at each other. I preached years ago in a, in a town in southeast Missouri. And oh, as an evangelist, just a young evangelist in my early 20s. And uh, the church was locked up. Oh, it was, I mean, locked up. You, they just, and so I, I, I remember, uh, went over in the fellowship hall to pray through the night. And I, I, I remember vividly because they made peanut bread in the fellowship hall. And, and, uh, and the residue of it was still there. And so I got it in the floor praying. It's all sticky. And I was like, my God, what's on this floor? And uh, found out later, amen. Now, they didn't leave me in a peanut brittle, and I'm still bitter about that right now. Amen. <laughs> but uh, early in the morning, the Lord spoke to me and said, there's two ladies in this church that have something in their hearts toward each other, and they've divided this church against each other. He said, it's to the point that one side's over here and the other side's over here. And he said, tomorrow in the service, tomorrow night, I want you to ask them to change sides and to mingle and to pray one with another. So I got up and started reading my text, and God said, I told you to say it. I said, okay. I said, I'll say it. And I said, I'm going to ask everybody on this side to come over here and over here, over here, and, and we're going to kind of mingle here. And there's a lady sitting right where Brother Thompson's sitting. And uh, she was uh, more than an overcomer. <laughs> and the devil and her would come out with a cookie, I promise you that, amen. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I 
I want to, but I'm not. Amen. And uh, uh, nah, 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 I'm not going to do it. I'd lose the service. We'd never get it back. And so about that time, well, Brother Thompson, that, that good sister, she looked at me and she said, I'm not moving. See, she was one of the sisters and the other sister was on the other side. I'm not moving. I said, okay. I said, I'm going to ask everybody on this side. <laughs> and she looks, and I mean, I said, I'm not moving. I, I was troubled, deeply troubled. Because I knew what the next day's headlines were going to read in that little town. <laughs> Pentecostal preacher goes crazy and kills fat old lady on the second pew. <laughs> but the love of God prevailed in my life that night. <laughs> And I said, I think we need to pray here for a while. They went to praying. All of a sudden, you feel something starting to break. Tears. And people started going to each other. That little old lady on the second pew, still standing there defiant. So I went down there to her and I said, listen, if you don't get that out of your heart, you're going to go to hell over it. She said, you think so? I said, I know so. And I said, I'll tell you where she's at. I said, she's still on that side. She's right over there. And I said, you need to go to her, and you guys need to get this fixed tonight because this is what's causing this church not to have a harvest. She said, I have to do this. And I said, yeah. She said, how did you know? I said, the Lord showed me last night in prayer. So she went down, come around the other way. I seen her go back to the other lady. She put her hand down. The other lady jerked back. And, went. and I said, church, we need to pray harder. Because what they didn't know was this is a pivotal moment for that church. We get the strife out of here. We get the confusion out. God will start hearing and answering our prayers. Whew. Finally, the other lady broke before the service was over. They were each other's necks weeping and sobbing and their families, it's about a family deal their families were being reconciled and the church no longer cared what side they were on, they were just meeting out in the, in the house, I'm telling you gospel truth before that week was over in a church that hadn't had anybody get the Holy Ghost in years, we baptized and seen 17 people get the Holy Ghost that week just simply because just simply because somebody said I'm going to get connected again I'm going to get the strife out of my life. I'm tired of the confusion in my home. I'm tired of every evil work in my life, in my church, my home. I'm closing. Bishop Stark, I admire you. I sincerely mean that I admire you. I have great respect for you. I consider you to be a man of great faith. Matter of fact, last night at the, after Brother uh, Blackshear, just shredded me. I was like, man, I ought to go up there and have the bishop lay his hands on me and prophesy over me. And uh, I'd receive it and all this stuff. So I want to set it up because I have the tremendous respect for you as a man of faith. And uh, I've been looking at this for several years. God, please help us. I... Um, can I just be transparent with you here? It was in that service that night that uh, God, uh, prayer that Saturday night, God spoke to me, gave me those two revelations. I'll give you two revelations for the end time. My people understand the mighty God in Christ, but they do not understand the mighty God in them. God began to give me a revelation of sonship. The next one was about God's perspective about the miraculous. He said, I called the miraculous children's bread. It's what a father just provides for his kids. You don't have to beg a father for it. It's his nature. It's in his DNA to provide for his family. 
and I'm your heavenly father. You don't have to beg me for the miracle. I went to Calvary to purchase that miracle for you. And uh, gave me those, and he said, tomorrow night, I will heal everything in the building. I was like, ooh. So I get to church the next night. I make it short. I get to church the next night. Or Sunday morning, I got up and I preached, starting into that revelation on sonship. And man, they were going crazy. They were running. It was one of them wild apostolic church services. They running to the walls, busting sheetrock and all that stuff, you know. And I mean, it was just, here they go. But I announced at the end of the service, I announced, um, I announced, we have a healing service tonight. God said he healed everything in the building. So we get back Sunday night and the whole atmosphere changed. Buddy, they, this service is extremely lively right now compared to that service. I'm a Pentecostal preacher. Got to have their response. I need to feel something emotional in this. God was teaching me a lesson. Once I tell you what I'm going to do, you don't ride on their emotions. My word is all you need to know. So <clears throat> I, uh, I preached and it was just horrible. So I thought. So I decided, I'm, okay, let's just do it. So I called for the prayer line. I said, all right, everybody needs a healing in their body, get in the prayer line. And, and they did. They lined up. And, and I looked down. The first lady down there was uh, old Sister Margie McGuire, the precious soul. And uh, she had Parkinson's, advanced Parkinson's. And her arm was drawn up and shaking. And to be honest with you, I looked at her and I thought, oh, you've got to be kidding me. We've got to start with this. Let me warm up a little bit. Let me see how it works with headaches and backaches. And uh, so I got ready to uh, pray. Got the bottle of oil, and I stepped off this side, and I started to cross. And I did. It felt like something draped over my shoulders. And I heard the word of the Lord say, the gift of faith now rests upon you. God gave me a revelation that night. See, your faith is like a checking account. And sometimes you have insufficient funds. You see what kind of faith it's needed for the miracle. And then you look at your faith and realize there's a deficit. And he said, this is where the gift of faith operates. I feel that deficit for you. I give you grace. I give you my gift to operate so it can be done because that precious soul needs a miracle desperately. This has nothing to do with you. You watch what I'm about to do. I didn't even get to anoint her. Didn't even get, I may be close as you and I are. Old Sister McGuire starts spinning, just spinning, spinning like a top. She went around four or five times, and then when she come back around, she's literally facing straight at me. And when she did, that arm dropped, and, and her eyes got about that big, and she looked at me, and she said, oh my God, it's gone, Brother Morgan, it's gone. And, Bishop, I'm still standing there. And it went from her to the lady behind her. She got her healing. It went to the person behind them. They got their healing. It went all the way down the line. Boom, 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 boom. All the way across the back. Boom, boom. All the way back up the other side. Everybody in that prayer line that night was healed. Was healed. You would think, in my transparency, I, I, I have battled with fear. I have a battle with fear. And uh, you would think that I'd get excited about that. But I, uh, I, that night I got home and I was troubled. Oh God, there's no future in this. I don't know anybody that I've seen operating gift ministries that's not went wacko and going to Waco. Just shipwreck, they get off. There's no future in this for me. I don't want it. Next day we had lunch. 
couple of preachers in the service. Oh, Brother Martin, it's such a great service. I said, it was. Man, I've never, yeah, great. Went on for about two or three weeks, troubled in my spirit. Oh, God, how can I be used in this ministry and not be destroyed? Is the Robinette girl here? Yeah. Stand up. I think I told, come right here. I think I told you this the other night. I'm going to tell you again. And uh, I was up the next morning getting the girls ready for school, getting ready to drive them to school. Phone rings back in the days of the 20-foot extension cords. And, and they'd curl all up. And, and the phone rang, and I was close to it, so I picked it up. I said, hello. Is this Brother Morgan? It is. My name is Marilyn Chenault. She said, I don't know how you feel about receiving something from a woman, but I feel like the Lord gave me something for you this morning. I said, okay. She, I said, man, if God gives you something, I don't care who you are. You can be a rooster or barn, or, or barn. I don't care who you are. And uh, she said, I've been praying this morning. I've been praying the last few days. She said, have you not been praying how can you be used in the gifts and not be destroyed? Man, I just sat down on the side of the bed. I said, yes, ma'am, I have. And she said, the Holy Ghost wants me to give you an answer. She said, remember this. The gifts operate from, through, and by love. And if you ever operate them out of that, you're on your way to destruction. And tears. She said, no, what I'm about to tell you has nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. It's just me wanting to tell you something. And I said, okay, tell me. She said, I can tell everything I need to know about a man by how he treats his wife. Have a good day. Click. <laughs> that was my first conversation with Marilyn Chanel. And I believe what Brother Downs told you. And I'm asking today, for that that was on her to rest on you. I told you the other night, your prayer life is going to have to change and you're just going to have to learn to talk to your friend. Talk to your friend. <laughs> so on my way to the Philippines, it asked me to teach at one of the LDI deals they do over there. And my subject was the gifts of spirit and operation, church, the world, and prophetic ministries in the church. I'm on my way over, Bishop, and I'm sitting there. I got my notes. Old Brother McLean gave me some notes years ago. I had them in my briefcase. And old Brother Sean. Alan and Lyndon's dad, he wrote a book on the gifts, tremendous book. I was preaching in Fredericton, New Brunswick when I was just a young evangelist, and Sister Sean was in that service and walked up. And she said, I think you'll enjoy reading this and handing me that book. And, and it was signed by Brother Sean. I still got it. And uh, so I had that book and old notes, and I was ready. I said, God, how in the world can we... See the gifts of the Spirit operate in the church like we need to see them operate. Why are they limited, it appears? So gently on that plane, the Holy Ghost said, if you'll start operating my gifts out of love, they'll operate more. But the gifts are not to affirm you. That's the pride of life. Third temptation. Am I going too far? Third temptation. He said, hey, it is written. I mean, the devil's now using scripture. It is written. And really what he was saying is, is I want to see the power of God operate in your life so you can confirm to me who you say you are. 
And that's the third temptation, which is the pride of life. You want all this stuff to operate so God can affirm you, which comes from pride. You, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. A little while later. Now, Sister Stone told me that day. She said, it's going to take you a while to get it, but you're going to get it. Because you see, Brother Stark, I guess I'm preaching this today because I was a son of thunder. I had a quick trigger finger. And uh, I used to ask God, give me the revelation, the inside of the Apostle Paul, to understand his writings. And then the Lord dealt with me and said, everybody wants to be like Paul. But nobody asked me to be like John. And very few asked me to be like me. Huh. So I started looking at the life of John, seeing the change, the metamorphosis change in his life, writing to us about the love of God. It's boiled in a pot of oil, and on and on it goes. Gwen Porsche. Eastwood told me, she said, uh, Brother Morgan, I've seen a dream. And I'm telling you, something's fixing up. Do this right here in this service. I had a dream, and in the dream, I seen, seen a service going on. And I, uh, she said, I knew. I said, the man up there was about faith, 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 faith. Said miracles were needed. And she said, uh, the young man sat down, and when he did, she said, I seen another preacher get up. And he started toward the pulpit. The whole atmosphere changed. It wasn't an atmosphere of faith, it was an atmosphere of compassion. And said, when compassion moved into that building through that man of God, miracles unprecedented miracles begin to happen. The Bible says that when Jesus was moved with compassion, because the only way that your faith can be operational, influence is through love. So the church, the end time, does not need more faith. What we need is, is we need a fresh baptism of the love of God. Bishop, I don't know how you teach, and I would never say anything contrary. If I do, he's right. I looked at that verse, covet the best gift earnestly. What in the world does that mean? I know we put them into three groups and all that stuff went on. Finally, it just hit me. The best gift's the ones that's needed at the time. And so, come here, young man. Yeah, you. And so, come up here. So uh, you have a need in your life, and I'm going to pray for you. And uh, the first thing I have to realize is I can't do this on my own. I need his help. God, I don't want to do this by faith. I'm asking you to let your love fill my heart, God. And I'm asking you to give me whatever gift is needed to minister to your child. I'm convinced if we can get there, it will unlock the windows of heaven. The atmosphere of our church and city, you can sit down, buddy. I've lied to you, told you. This is the statement I'm gonna make that some may disagree. It was not miracle signs and wonders that got Jerusalem's attention. It was when they seen those people selling everything, bringing it to the apostles' feet and laying it down, saying, distribute this to the needy. Whew. See, they'd seen other miracles. But brother, when they seen that, this is not our nature. Something's happening here. Not minimizing signs and wonders. We're so, we gotta have signs and wonders, and we do. 
That's not what's going to get Columbus's attention or Cleveland's attention or San Francisco's attention. It's when we walk out of here and they see us helping the needs of others and they see the agape, the love of God flowing through us. And they say, look, there's other churches in this town that have miracles. There's other places that might be able to call some pseudo fire down. But that, that's God there. That's his nature bleeding through. My God. Let's, 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 let's just pause here a minute. My cool shot died. Ooh. Maybe, maybe it would be good for you to connect to someone that we've done it a lot, but we're going to do it a little different. I want you to connect all the way across this room and this building to somebody, as many as you can. Then I want you to pray, God, I'm asking you right now to fill my heart with your love. I've got disconnected from you. Help me to connect with you right now. I believe miracles are getting ready to happen. Then once that happens, I want you to say these words. I don't know what the need is in their life, but I'm asking you with compassion in your spirit, I'm asking you to let whatever gift that needs to operate operate because I don't have enough on my own and these are your children and you love them so I'm asking you to help me with one of the gifts to minister to your child let's put it into practice today what you say and then let's not stop let's fill the streets of our cities with what I'm talking about right now we'll see the miraculous begin to happen in an unprecedented way you ready to do it you're not screaming. Don't have to scream. Connect with somebody close to you. You may want to stand. I don't know. See, here's the deal. You have no idea unless God shows you what that brother or sister is going through. But they are made in the image of God. They're his children and so are you. You don't know what they brought to this conference. You don't know the torment that's been in their mind even in this service. You don't know the pain that's been in their body while we're sitting here. I don't need God's power to affirm who I am, but I do need it to minister to this person the way that God wants me to minister to them. For God so loved, for God so loved that he gave. Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have. Ooh. Now pray for them as I gave you instructions a while ago. Ask God, Lord, help me today to I connect to the vine, the fruit would manifest to this person. Touch them right now. Touch them right now. Touch them right now. I ask that the gifts of the Spirit would operate through your body right now. Woo. I ask that people that came in here fearful, that the love of God would dissipate that fear. Yes. Yes.
And if there's something in your heart, there's something in your heart, get it out today. Forgive and release that person so that his love can flow through you where it's not, it's not stopped, it's not dammed up, but it can flow through you. I ask that God heal you today spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially. Bring health into you. To bring health into you. That's it. Keep praying for him. You may want to go to somebody else now. God's going to use you today. God's going to use you today. God's going to use you today. You don't have to beg him for it. Just ask for it.
Let's entertain the presence of the Lord for just a little bit. Open your spirit and let's entertain his holy presence. God is working. God is moving. If you're sitting, please stand and move. Ask the Lord to direct you. You're going to go bless someone right now. You're going to go release a blessing in their life. So just move and find someone. Ask the Lord to give you direction. But there are people here who need what you have. There are people here who need what you have. And the healing of the man at the gate beautiful was initiated by such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, just as Brother Morgan has instructed us, you're going to begin to pray for some some for someone close that, that the Lord directs you to. Now face them and begin to pray a blessing on them. Release the working of miracles. Release the operation of the gifts of healing. Mm. My, 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 there's something powerful. That's it, let your voice out. Let your voice out. These signs shall follow them that believe. 
If you are a believer, if the person you are praying for has sickness in their body, when you pray for them in Jesus' name, they shall recover. That's what the book says. And we believe the word. There are people here with emotional scars and they are about to be healed. Let the love of God flow through you. That gift will work by love. I lay bolo bo shile abata ha ye di alabata bahota ha ye bata bahota baha ye ti alabahoti ka. Yeso, ye toholi ti hasahata baba. If you are in need of a miracle, ask the person to pray for you to receive that miracle now. Don't stop, don't stop. Let the 
God has answered prayer all over this house in the last few minutes. Would you clap your hands and give thanks to him for what he's done? Now the Bible says that when the woman with the issue of blood came behind Jesus and touched his garment, immediately her issue of blood staunched. The Bible says she felt in her body. She had a witness, a physical witness that she had been healed although she did not have the proof of that, but she felt it. And on the basis of what she felt, she claimed her healing. Some of you have, God has just done something for you, but it will be a little while before you'll be able to, to have the evidence of that. But if you felt in your body, if you felt just a moment ago that something happened, that God touched you, I want you to raise your hand right now just to give us an... Uh, Brother, Brother Smith, come on up here and help me. If you felt when we prayed, I want you to lift your hand because we want to give glory and honor to the Lord for what he's done. <laughs> There are 33 people who are testifying that something just happened to them. Hallelujah. 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 This has been just a little bit different service today, but we have heard from God. Pastor Jimmy, you want to end? Closing? Okay. Well, we've been here for uh, two hours and 45 minutes. Y'all ready to go home? <laughs> Let's lift our hands, our voices, our spirits together and give thanks to the Lord for what he's done in Awakenings 2022. What an amazing service that we have had today, an amazing message preached by Brother Morgan. There are still people receiving what they need from the Lord today, but we wanted to thank you all for tuning in today and tuning in for the whole conference weekend. It's been such an incredible, incredible conference, and we know that God has done great things here, and we can't wait to hear the testimonies that everyone will share when they get back home. And we want you to make plans next year to be here with us in the building. September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, we will have Awakenings 2023, and we want you to be here in the building. Thank you so much again for tuning in, and we will see you next year.